Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm your host, Tom Powers, with episode 16. We have one more episode coming on July 28th that will mark the end of season one. Then I'll be getting ready for the Toronto International Film Festival. But don't panic, Pure Nonfiction will return with season two in early September. On this episode, I talked to Alex Gibney. His new film is called Zero Days, about the Stuxnet computer virus and the rise of cyber warfare. Over the last 11 years, Alex has directed more than 15 feature-length documentaries. That's more than any director in any decade. His breakthrough in 2005 was Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, about the energy and commodities company that went bankrupt and became a symbol for corporate fraud. I think the Enron story is so fascinating because people perceive it as a story that's about numbers, that it's somehow about all these complicated transactions. But in reality, it's a story about people, and it's really a human tragedy. Alex came to specialize in telling stories about power and corruption that are ultimately stories about people. In We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks, Alex was denied an interview with Julian Assange, but he talked to many WikiLeaks associates for a critical profile. In Client 9, The Rise and Fall of Elliot Spitzer, Alex interviewed the New York State governor who resigned over a prostitution scandal. And he also interviewed one of the escorts who had never spoken to the media before. Alex's other films include The Armstrong Lie, about Lance Armstrong and the doping scandals in cycling. Mia Maxima Culpa, about sex abuse in the Catholic Church and Taxi to the Dark Side, about the U.S. program for torture during the war in Afghanistan. That film won an Academy Award. Here's Alex in his acceptance speech. This is dedicated to two people who are no longer with us. Dilawar, the young Afghan taxi driver, and my father, uh, a Navy interrogator, who urged me to make this film because of his fury about what was being done to the rule of law. Let's hope we can turn this country around, move away from the dark side and back to the light. Thank you very much. Alex's father, Frank Gibney, spent much of his life as a journalist. Alex talked about him in a recent New York Magazine profile, and I began our conversation by asking about his father. How much did his work as a journalist influence you? A lot. I mean, I, I was very proud of the fact that he had been a journalist and, you know, I always thought that was a noble profession. He always thought it was a noble profession. And, and I think it, you know, even to the end of his life, by the end of his life, he was more of a businessman than a professor. You know, he, he was vice chairman of the board of editors Encyclopedia Britannica. But he always considered himself a journalist. And he carried himself that way in the sense that he was always curious right to the end. And he could talk to anybody, young, old, black, white, you know, because it just – he had a sense of curiosity about the world that remained right to the end of his life. So you didn't have a rebellion against your father in that sense? Not in that sense. I mean, he and I disagreed about some things, sometimes violently. We did a, a TV series together called Pacific Century. And I remember having screaming fights with him, which he didn't anticipate. And he must have been more than a little bit miffed because he allowing me to come into that series, which is his area of expertise, which was East Asian, was a gift to me. But <laughs> I repaid him by uh, – What were the things you'd argue about? Well, we'd argue about political stuff. You know, we'd argue about the U.S. occupation of Japan and to what extent it crushed certain democratic elements or not. And we'd argue about the Cold War a lot, you know, because he was a virulent anti-communist. Hmm. And, and I can see his point of view, but it never led me to the place where so long as you were fighting communism, anything was okay. Um, and I don't think it led him quite to that place either, but he was more hardcore than I was. So it was usually political disagreements. We never had any real personal disagreements except once. I, I, I failed to uh, call him as quickly as I might have after a, a rather bad heart operation. Uh, and he, he called me out and he was right. I was wrong. You described in the New York Magazine article that at some point he was trying to like set you up with journalism jobs and you were really headed in the direction of film. That's right. I mean, he he saw, OK, I graduated from Yale. Now it was time to have the requisite interviews with Time, Newsweek, and maybe newspapers. He was a fan of the Newsweeklies because that's where he came from. 
And, and that wasn't interesting to me. I, at the time, I viewed them with great suspicion mm-hmm. as being kind of, you know. Establishment. Or- very establishment. The idea, you know, that was at the time in fiction realm of, you know, Scorsese and Coppola and so forth and so on. And I didn't really understand that that was also part of a different kind of business establishment as well. <laughs> but but there was nevertheless a kind of a sense uh, that you could reach more people and there was a, you know, the news weeklies crushed your personality in the name of representing the point of view of the news weekly, which is ultimately what happened to cable television after, for, uh, for a certain period of time, you know, where – where each cable network had its own brand mm-hmm. and every individual had to subsume themselves to that brand. So that's how I saw the Newsweeklies. And I wanted something where you could express yourself, be it fiction or nonfiction. And I was interested in both at the time and reach a ton of people. So it was it, it was a heady time. And it seemed like this was a moment when um, you could say something artistically and reach millions of people. D- did you feel like film was more vibrant than print? I did. I, I, I did. I, I just had that, that sense about the world. It wasn't that I didn't read books and think how, how wonderful they were, but this idea of reaching a tremendous number of people, that was, that was, was what seemed exciting about it. And how did that go for you as you, uh, as you <laughs> entered the film Not world? so well. I mean, I, after college, I went to UCLA Film School. I left before I finished – because I got a job with the Samuel Goldwyn Company, another favor my dad did for me. He had known Sam in London just after the war. And I started basically in the basement. And and next thing I knew, I was cutting. Uh, I was doing restoration work. I was recutting feature films for domestic release, like Gregory's Girl mm. by Bill Forsyth and a, a movie by Paul Verhoeven called Spetters. I was cutting exploitation trailers for TV, you know, things like Invasion of the Bee Girls and what was the – there was Shockwaves, which was about mutant Nazis that came up from the ocean floor. <laughs> and I briefly had a, you know, a, a career uh, – not a career, but I, you know, I, I was briefly uh, finally graduated to be feature film editor. But I, I So was, as you were doing those day jobs, were you polishing up a script at yes, home? Yes. Yes. I was always thinking, I, you know, I want to direct. And I was. I was writing proposals. I was writing scripts. I was doing all that at home, hoping that, you know, I would, I would find a way forward. Um, but when I left the Goldwyn Company, I, I left in part because Sam nudged me out. Uh, having given me a number of opportunities, I, I actually tried to organize a union at Sam's shop. <laughs> I stopped short of actually going the full distance once the uh, NLRB guy had me into the office and said, you know, we can bring a legal action against the company. I thought, hmm, maybe I'll stop short here, <laughs> you know, because this was a favor my dad had done for me, you know. So uh, once again, I, I was I, – I think I was afflicted emotionally with a problem that my dad had, which was – you know, you're, to be successful, you're supposed to suck up and kick down. And he and I both did just the opposite. You know, it's, it strikes me when I look at your career, you have this breakthrough 11 years ago with Enron, the smartest guys in the room. You're in your early 50s at that point. When I think of other documentary makers comparable to your career, Michael Moore, Morgan Spurlock, and Errol Morris, they had their breakthroughs in their 30s when they got their voice, when you could describe something as that's an Errol Morris film. What did it mean for you to to not get that until your 50s? Well, <laughs> the truth was by the time the my 50s came around, I wasn't sure I was ever going to get it. And I had spent a lot of years, I mean, I had done some interesting work. Uh, a lot as a producer. I'd done a lot of scuffling. You know, when I left the Goldwyn era, I had I had done some independent writing for various magazines and newspapers and um, gotten odd jobs. Uh, and, and I'd done some TV documentaries and developed fiction scripts and so forth. But I wouldn't say my career was headed, you know, anyplace significant. And then I got a call from my pal Mark Levin, who I'd worked with on this Asia doc that my dad had gotten me on to doc series. And Mark Levin was starting a new company, and I was going to run the TV division, both fiction and nonfiction. And I moved back here, and that's what kind of changed my career. But even then, you know, I went through a period where I was kind of the guy in the background, the executive producer or the producer. I was not creatively 
kind of calling the shots. I think there was a period of time when in New York's documentary community, you were known as a highly capable producer. You produced Martin Scorsese's Blue series and looking at that from the outside, a stranger wouldn't have known that you had these other stories to tell. Correct. I think that's true. Though it was interesting, I learned a lot being a producer and it stood me in good stead when I finally got, you know, behind the director's chair. I mean, I had directed some TV documentaries, but in the feature film arena, it stood me in good stead. You know, I was interested, one of my heroes is Louis Bunuel. It was interesting to me that Bunuel also spent a number of years as a producer. And, they, and he, later on in life, he became known as Senior Clapboard because they used to say that, you know, to cut a Louis Bunuel film, you just had to cut the clapboards off and, mm-hmm. and put the film together because he kind of pre-visualized it in his head and was always very concerned about being economical. And I always learned about Sidney Lumet that he got gigs because he never went over budget, you know. So there was something in that producer's mindset that said, well, you know, you can – play this game to your advantage if you get the opportunity. So what were the circumstances that gave you the opportunity to do Enron Smartest Guys in the Room? Well, I I should probably rewind just slightly because I think the thing that set me off on the Enron possibility was a film I did with Eugene Jarecki Mm -hmm. called The Trials of Henry Kissinger. I wrote and produced that film, but in effect, I was the one being entrusted by the money to deliver it. And Eugene was the director. And, And so... That project made me realize the possibility of the feature documentary because this was a period, uh, going back to what I said earlier, in which cable TV was horrible Mm. in the sense that it was branded television and everything was supposed to conform to the brand. So there was no room for any kind of independent sense of style or, 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 or purpose. But in the case of the trials of Henry Kissinger, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a peppy and interesting uh, film and also ruddered very strongly against the view at the time, which was that, you know, Kissinger was basically a force for good. <laughs> and I think uh, it, it had great timing in that it comes out pretty early on in the Bush administration. People are hungry for counter voices. Yeah. And it ended up actually the the victims committee of the, uh, you know, the 9-11 victims committee saw it. And as a result, militated very strongly against the idea that Henry Kissinger be considered to be the head of the 9-11 commission, which was on the table at some point. But it, it, it played in theaters. And because it played in theaters, it, it could say what it wanted. It was entertaining enough so that people would go to it. And then because it was entertainment, Networks could put it on. The Sundance Channel put it on and I was off and running. And suddenly I thought, wow, there's something to this idea. And I had also done the blues by that point, watching these great directors like Marty and Vim Vendors and Clint Eastwood do their own thing, but also have this sense of respect for the real world. So I, I was ready. And, uh, and then how did you flick the switch between that readiness and getting to make the Enron film? My um, sister-in-law at the time had – given me a copy of the book, Smartest Guys in the Room, which I loved. And of course, I knew about the Enron story. And having done this kind of series about the political economy of of, of Asia, you know, I was very tuned in to money issues and how fun they could be. So, and I thought these characters are fantastic. This would make a great story. And I had an entree to Jason Cleo, who was just starting a company called HDNet Films for Mark Cuban. I remember that. And he suggested making a very, very, very short proposal to Mark. And I came up with a number, which I I fear was much too low. (laughs) And I was told that Mark was a very binary character. He would either say yes or no. And he said yes. And we were off and running. And this is also very early on in, in the incarnation of Magnolia. Magnolia ultimately ended up getting the film and doing very well with it. You know, it was a, it was a big success. And what were the things that you learned on that? I learned a lot. I mean, that film was like a classroom. There's so much going on in that film. I learned that um, it's very hard to make a film, a documentary film, on a schedule because things keep changing. Indeed, you know, one of the key interviews in that film, we didn't get on board until very, very late in the process. This was in the early fall, and we were heading for Sundance, and it, it meant a radical restructure of the film. Um, I realized that, you know, and this is something partially that I had, was applying from what I learned on the Blue series, 
the only rules for a documentary are the ones that you make up, mm-hmm. you meaning the author. And and so we had so much fun on that. Um, Susan Matamid, who's the producer, Allison Ed- Elwood, who's the, the editor, and, and myself, and Marise Alberti, who came on. That was the first time I had worked with her. We were just trying things. And the ability to experiment both with the archive, which was kind of wildly metaphorical and not literal, um, the kind of set pieces that we did, whether it be the strippers or the shredding, you know, that there was a, a sense of possibility that that really came um, true in that film. And it, it made me realize that if you think about how you want to make the film at the beginning, it can always change, but the possibilities are endless. Well, it's a film that announces from the very beginning, the opening scene, that it's it's trying to be a film. It wants to be it has ambitions to be a film. It's using music and it's What's uh, he building in there? The Tom Waits song. Right. Right. And and then there's a, recre- a recreation right up at the top of a suicide, which uh, comes out of thin air. And then you realize it connects immediately to real life footage. And so there's a consciousness about how these things connect. Which at that point when you're doing that in 2005 – Recreations are kind of established as uh, acceptable tools since Errol Morris and Thin Blue Line, but but still borderline. I mean, borderline. there's more bad recreations than good recreations, borderline. and so it was it was a risk to do that. It was a risk, a real risk, and and we thought a lot about how they should be, how it should be used, because I was deeply afraid that using a recreation further on down in the film would just be an awful idea Mm -hmm. because by then you'd already be familiar who the real characters were and then you'd be recreating a scene with these real characters. In this case, it was just a human being. You didn't know who that human being was and you were just on the seat with him watching the smoke from the cigarette, watching him drink a bottle of water, listen to Billie Holiday's God Bless the Child and then kaboom, he kills himself and then you cut to the real thing where you understand who this guy was. And, and, and what it was all about. So how we were going to use it, we gave a great deal of thought to that before we, we ended up doing it. Though, you know, I think back now to doing it, I mean, I didn't have any idea about, you know, getting proper locations or doing any of that stuff. We stole all that stuff, you know, in somewhere in, in Pacific Palisades. You know, we, we, we found a place where we could quickly put up a few lights. Maurice Alberti famously got into a fight with one of the neighbors who was trying to shut us down. And, but, uh, but it worked out. <laughs> All right. I want to try something. I want to, I'm going to do a lightning round here. I'm going to name one of your films. You tell me what was the hardest thing to make about it. Oh, Jesus. Taxi to the Dark Side. Getting anybody or anything to show. Okay. Client Nine. Finding the Escort. Mia Maxima Culpa. Finding the Structure. We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks. Completely changing the story when the key subject gave me no access. Finding Fela. Finding a Structure. Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief. Also, Structure. It's always the hardest. Steve Jobs, The Man and the Machine. Finding the story. And, and I, I, it was actually searching for what the meaning was. I had no idea when I started. Really? Really. I, I, that was one where I was interested in exploring the life of Steve Jobs. But I really and, – and I was interested in this idea that so many people came out as if he were Martin Luther King or John Lennon when he died – and he was a businessman. And I thought, why? Why did so many people care so deeply? And I've since gotten in fights with people on Twitter, which I always swear I will never do. And then I <laughs> always do it again. I, I've got to put the Sangiovese filter back on my Twitter account. But that really was the moment of curiosity for me. And 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 then it, I ended up exploring values. That's really what that film is about. So did Steve Jobs start as your interest or someone coming to you saying, we'd like you to make a film about Steve Jobs? It started when I thought I might have access to a huge cache of audio tapes of Steve Jobs. Ultimately, I didn't get that cache. But by then, I already made the proposal. (laughs) We were rolling and I'd become interested in the subject. So many of these films are journalistically based or, or intersect with journalism. And I've seen you describe yourself 
as a filmmaker with journalistic baggage. Mm. And I wonder how you would describe the differences between what you do as a documentary filmmaker and journalism. Well, first of all, I think of journalism as a print form. So I, I don't know how to – you know, reckon with that slightly. I'm a little bit more comfortable. But there's broadcast journalism, there right? Is I mean, broadcast there's broadcast journalism. And, and, but broadcast journalism has very sort of rigid rules for how it presents itself formally. You know, how you present the, the broadcast journalist, the, the reaction shot. There's really very, atten very little attention paid to mood or uh, ambiguity or setting or context. Um, and and, and often story structure isn't that interesting to broadcast journalism. This is something, you know, I was interested actually talking to Al Mazels, you know, because a lot of people think of him as the ultimate fly on the wall, cinema verite cameraman. He said, oh, I don't think of myself that way. He thought of himself coming out of the tradition in film as Norman Mailer, Tom Wolfe, the new journalism, right? right? That bringing something of your own – to the table. And I guess that's the other part of it too, is that one of the things I learned watching the directors on the blues work is they were bringing a, a, an authored sense of nonfiction. In other words, it was, it was definitely point of view, but in the broadest sense, not, not, not meaning that I'm going to tell you what I think, but allowing your own investigation to be part of the story. In a minute, I'll be back with Alex Gibney to talk about his new film, Zero Days. But first, a word from our sponsor. Pure Nonfiction is sponsored by Sundance Now Doc Club. Discover hundreds of documentary films selected by head curator Tom Powers. Now you can watch the two films that Alex Gibney describes as his breakthrough works, The Trials of Henry Kissinger and Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. You can access Sundance Now Doc Club on your TV, computer, or mobile device. Go to docclub.com to sign up for a free trial. In Alex Gibney's new film, Zero Days, he opens questions about U.S. intelligence working in cyber warfare. It's a topic that meets a wall of silence from government officials on the record. I, I don't answer that question. Unfortunately, I can't comment. I do not know how to answer that. Two answers before you even get started. I don't know, and if I did, we wouldn't talk about it anyway. <laughs> but how can you have a debate if everything's secret? I think right now that's just where we are. No one wants to... Countries aren't happy about confessing or, or owning up to what they did because they're not quite sure where they want the system to go. Alex follows the story of a U.S.-created virus called Stuxnet, that got exposed when it spread to computers all over the world. Private researchers analyzed Stuxnet and determined it was created to get inside the machines at an Iranian nuclear facility. Here's a private researcher from Semantic, Eric Chen. At that time, things became very scary to us. Here you had malware potentially killing people, and that was something that was always Hollywood-esque to us, that we'd always laugh at when people made that kind of assertion. Alex teamed up with New York Times reporter David Sanger, who specializes in reporting on the intelligence community. In the film, Alex talks to anonymous sources from the National Security Administration. They provide more details about Stuxnet and reveal an even bigger cyber warfare program called Nitro Zeus. This agent's words are spoken by a performer. Unlike Snowden, who was a contractor, I was in NSA. I believe in the agency, so what I'm willing to give you will be limited, but we're talking because everyone's getting the story wrong and we have to get it right. We have to understand these new weapons. The stakes are too high. I asked Alex how he came to make Zero Days. I came to it by suggestion, which often happens with me. Um, sometimes you do films about things you know a lot about. Sometimes you do things because you don't know anything about it. And that was certainly mostly the case with Stuxnet. I had known a little bit about it. But Mark Schmugger, who had encouraged me to do the WikiLeaks film and also helped to secure the financing, um, came back to me with this story and said, you know, this would be a good follow-up and this is a really interesting story. I know a little bit about it and I started to investigate. And, and at what point did, did that happen? Like how much was known in the world about Stuxnet well, when he came to you? Well, you know, 
I look back and to see when the first proposals were written, and that was in summer of 2012, which was not too long after David Sanger published his articles in the New York Times. I think it was June 1st, 2012. That's that right. David Sanger published a key article. That's right. So it was not long after that. So Mark Schmucker comes to you with this idea. Did did you have assets in place? Did, did you have a relationship with Sanger? Did you have no? Uh, we had we had none of those things. The Mark, you had a newspaper clipping. We had a newspaper clipping. That's it. And it reminded me all over again of Taxi to the Dark Side. When I started Taxi, I didn't even have that. And finally, I found the newspaper article I was interested in. Um, but um, that was it. We had a newspaper clipping. And what was like, a key breakthrough to like in the process of like starting to collect the material that you need to make this film? Probably the key breakthrough was a very long uh, interview that I did – or two interviews that I did with – Eric Chen and Liam Amorku from Symantec, the antivirus company. In the film, they describe how Stuxnet came to their attention. As just a virus that was out in the wild and that they had to uh, analyze because they didn't know what its function was. It looked pretty malicious and, and they had to break it down on behalf of their customers because it was infecting a lot of computers all over the world. What was perfect about them was that they became my detectives. I like detective stories. And, in, in, you know, there's another aspect of journalism I like, which is investigations. But I, I, you know, sometimes I see it more as the private eye, not the official, because I, I've never... You're it's, Sam Spade. No. Well, it's been tough for me because in some, some cases, because I don't have an organization behind me, really. You know, when I went to... Afghanistan for Taxi to the Dark Side, I didn't have a bureau to go check in with. You know, I carried a camera in a bag and, and met some guy at the airport who, you know, was two hours late and I didn't know what I was going to do if he didn't show up there. So more of the private eye trying to figure out what's going on. And so these guys were surrogates for me. They were private eyes. They were work for a private company. They were trying to figure it out themselves. And by Hearing their story of how they figured it out, I figured it would it could get us all to know what was involved here. One of the things that strikes me about your work is that you 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 frequently uncover sources that other people haven't uncovered before. Uh, in the case of the Elliot Spitzer film and Client Nine, you uncover the uh, uh, the escort, Angelina, yes. Yeah. Who had never been uncovered before, and in Armstrong Gly, you're uncovering things about the Lance Armstrong case that we haven't heard before, and, and and so on. This one, in zero days, feels like one of the most daunting of all because you're uncovering NSA sources who uh -huh. uh, have many good reasons, including desire not to spend a good part of their life in jail to not talk. What impresses me is that you're able to go in and out of these different worlds. Normally, a journalist like David Sainer, I understand that he has NSA contacts because he spent several decades just working on this topic. He hasn't you know, taken a side trip to look into the world of doping and bicycling or Albany politics uh, around the career of, of Elliot Spitzer. So I'm curious, when you walk into a new world, how do you start navigating well, usually you begin to start familiarizing yourself with that world and you go to where those people are. You know, when I, the first thing I did on, on the Armstrong – like a Fort Meade bar that – Well, yes. Uh, or, or you go to various symposia or, you know, study groups where people are hanging out and, and, and not just me but members of my team. You know, you start to have to start familiarizing yourself with a this, with this topic and some of the people involved with the topic. You start talking to them. The next thing you know, you, you, you find out stuff. Um, and – uh, and often I will also go to journalists who have been on the beat. And that's why – that's what brought me to David Sanger because he had a portion of the story I figured I would never, ever get to. I mean we – and I say we, the team, particularly Javier Botero who's the co-producer and I, um, you know, got to some NSA sources. Yeah, well, Say a little bit more about Javier Botero and what his background is that the – well, Javier came on board. I mean, he was um, he had been a computer programmer. He came on board as a as a you know researcher on We Steal Secrets, 
and he is super smart, and he knows this territory very well. So when we were thinking about this, you know, with, I said, well, would you like to come on to this film? And he said, yes. And he, in fact, dug in and, and wrote uh, the early proposal that helped to get us uh, the funding. So he was a key member of the team, mostly because he could understand this stuff. He had Stuxnet <laughs> on his computer in the office. And so... By accident? Or no, on purpose. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, so, and so having somebody like that was, was, was invaluable. So let me get back to David Sainer. When you approached uh, a journalist like David Sainer, who's invested his life pretty much uh, into to this topic, um, how does that uh, courtship take place? Because I have to imagine that David Sainer must be very protective of his own sources and, and information. That's true. But, I mean, he is a source on this, but he was also a consultant. So that was one of the ways we did it. But also he wants to know what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I think he felt it was a story that was one that he had done both in a book and in articles. Uh, now we're going to do it in a different medium that feels a little less threatening than if I was a Washington Post reporter hmm. coming in and saying, hey, pal. How about you? <laughs> Let's team up. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's not going to go well with his editor. Right. So what were the things that your team were able to uncover uniquely that, that people who had already been on this beat hadn't cracked? Well, it was really, you know, I should say there's some other people, you know, we were watching out there who were also doing good work. Kim Zetter wrote a very important book about this subject. But the some of the key things were – uh, we dug deeper into the whole U.S.-Israel relationship story and 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 took it a little bit further than David Sanger, I think, had taken it. And the other big one was the discovery of something that went past the Stuxnet story, which was this uh, operation called Nitro Zeus, which was an NSA operation uh, operated out of Cyber Command to basically infiltrate uh, and – Put, uh, infiltrate the critical infrastructure of Iran and put in place malware that could basically have shut down the country. That was a jaw dropper for all of us. And when the film had its world premiere at the Berlin Film Festival in February, David Sainer published an article in the New York Times simultaneously revealing to the world along with your film about Nitro Zeus. Yes. And that was important for us. It was important for us for a lot of reasons because, um, you know, just – for a long time, we tried very hard to establish a good relationship with the NSA without any real success. You know, we asked for access. Like an official relationship. An official yeah. relationship, yes. Um, and just prior to the Berlin Film Festival, um, you know, as David Sanger was readying his piece, which was going to include some of the reporting that we had done on Nitro Zeus, you know, he went to the uh, ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and let them know in advance that – uh, classified information was about to be revealed and could they make any uh, – could the government make any good claim as to why that was going to be uh, harmful to anybody, which they were not able to do? That must be a nail-biting period of time. It was a nail-biting period of time and I think there was a lot of concern from our financiers about legal issues. In fact, I know there was because <laughs> I spent a lot of time on the phone with my attorney. And so forth and so on. But, you know, the best advice and, and going back to something you said earlier about what filmmakers should keep in mind in terms of how they operate like journalists, often the simple answer is so long as you're operating as a journalist, as an independent journalist trying to find out stuff, you're always going to be in, in a better place hmm. than appearing to or actually representing somebody else. You used documents from the Edward Snowden files, and it was striking to me that three years after Edward Snowden started working with reporters, that there's still secrets coming out of that trove. How did you, you know, know where to look in the Snowden files, know the, connect the dots between what you were working on and what's in the Snowden files? The documents that we showed in the film had, had been previously released and published. That said, you know, I did managed to reach out to Snowden himself and, and get some answers to some key questions. And also, you know, I, I was helped by Laura Poitras and uh, a researcher that she works with a lot. So we were able to get a, a reasonable amount of guidance. But, you know, there's a, 
the amount of what he's revealed is is extraordinary and ultimately hugely helpful in piercing this kind of crazy secrecy that uh, the government has has well, adopted. One of the facts that comes out of there is that the president has the authority to authorize cyber warfare against a country that we don't have a formal declaration of war against. Well, Do I'm not right? sure I'm not sure he has that authority and it's unclear exactly what the legality of Stuxnet was, whether it was legal. It was a covert operation and very often you say, well, it's covert. All bets are off. That's a very gray area legally as far as I understand. But the – Do you think that's one reason why people in your film consistently don't want to talk about it? Because, yes. Uh, because this could wind up in court someday? P perhaps. I mean and I think uh, because it's a covert operation, they're saying, well, we can't disclose any details about the covert operation where I begin to find it very bizarre. You can understand that prior to the operation – <laughs> it's covert. You don't want to give up details about that. But once the operation's been blown, mm -hmm. the virus is spread all over the world to say I can't officially comment on whether or not there was such a thing as Stuxnet. That's a little bit bizarre. <laughs> right. Or to even be able to talk about a newspaper article that's already been published. Correct. Okay. Uh, those kinds of restrictions I, I, I find bizarre in the extreme. This film was not an easy visual film to make. You, you don't have the Tour de France going on. Does that you know, give you a pause when you're taking on a topic? Yes. And it made me wonder about this one in particular because, in fact, I had had similar issues or problems on the film I did about WikiLeaks, We Steal mm -hmm. Secrets. But once we had the detectives in place – Two key things helped us out. One was – well, three th key things. One is we went all over the world and that added a kind of uh, – it, it had the – the story itself had a kind of born-like feeling to begin with. You know, this is happening in Moscow, Dateline Moscow, Dateline Tel yeah. Aviv and so forth and so on. So there was that. But we wanted to make a character – out of the code. There was no person at the heart of the story. It was the code that was at the heart of the story. And so finding a way to visualize that code in a way that fit with the story, that was a huge challenge. And that was a challenge that went on for about two years. I mean, it was not the kind of thing where we dial up the graphics house at mm -hmm. the end and said, put in some cool graphics. <laughs> we worked hard with their, with Framestore, who, who did that stuff, to make sure that it had a character that felt right for us, a look that felt right for us, and also actually integrated real bits and pieces of the actual Stuxnet code. So it wasn't just eye candy, you know, so... And, and it had to feel like it was revealing itself over time in the course of the narrative. So, so you, you know, all those issues had to be reckoned with. And then the other big thing, which we didn't really think about at the start because we didn't know we were going to have to go there, is the way we ended up visualizing the NSA source. And that also was a, a huge technical exploration because we – like a little bit like in Client 9 where I used an actress to represent somebody who didn't want to be seen. I used an actress this time but wanted the actress to be in the context, in the sort of digital context that we were operating in and to have a kind of a hacked look so that it wasn't too pretty or pristine uh, or sh she wasn't too pretty or pristine. I mean she's a very pretty woman but the, the, the way it looked had a kind of hacked quality. And that took a long time to get that right. In fact, we were wrestling with that right on down the actual visual look of that right on down to the final online edit because we wanted the ability to change the way the character looked over the course of the narrative. We needed that flexibility in part because one of the things we were doing with that character is playing with audiences' expectations of sources – um, and outing those sources or not. And so you come to a certain point where you feel like, oh, my God, they're showing too much. Mm -hmm. And the audience is intended to be uncomfortable. Uh, and then we reveal, you know, the conceit at a certain point. One of the most taken for granted aspects of documentary filmmaking is the talking head uh, interview. Uh, th these are a big part of uh, of your film. And I wonder how you approach that visually. There's usually a visual plan for each film, depending on exactly what it is. And sometimes within each film, 
different characters get different treatments depending on who they are. For example, in Client 9, um, you know, I have a my own version of Errol Morris's in Terratron. I, I like to sit in the room, so I have a simple little box that fits over the camera with a 45-degree angle mirror of, of prompter glass so that, you know, they'll see my face, but I'm sitting at a 90-degree angle to the camera. I use that device on two people, Spitzer and Angelina, the escort. Everybody else is looking slightly off angle. And that was to create an obvious relationship between them, but also between their secret and and the filmmaker. So I, I give it a lot of thought. And now I also almost always, if I can, shoot interviews with two cameras, at least, sometimes more. And May Max and Maximum I think we had four on a single subject. Because it allows you to stay in the moment. One bugaboo that I have is, you know, very often people will refer, you know, in a sort of derogatory way to talking heads as if that's a bad thing. You know, uh, cinema verite good, talking heads bad. Yeah. I have nothing uh, – I mean, cinema verite is great, but there's nothing bad to me about an interesting person saying something that's powerful and in a context that is uh, full of – intrigue and ambiguity. It's not the kind of talking head that you get on the nightly news program. It's a, it's a completely different kind of thing. I'm curious how you set people up to be part of this uh, experience. So when you bring when you sit someone down on a chair to interview them, there's lights, there's cameras, maybe there's four cameras, there's a few different people in the room. And here you're about to ask this person to answer uncomfortable questions, maybe reveal private details about their life, maybe uh, talk about controversial things that where they don't want to choose their words uh, carefully. And maybe we have to do this all in a prescribed amount of time because you're talking to like an important government official who or business official who's you know given you a half hour to do it. What are the things that you do to make that work? Well, you've already sketched out a lot of the issues that you have to take into consideration, which is it it always depends on the context. If you have somebody who's only there for half an hour, you operate in a very different way than you might. If you know that you're going to have somebody for two or three hours or more, um, you know, I went back and interviewed Elliot Spitzer five times. So uh, always gain him to wear the same tie. Yes, <laughs> always in the same location. You know, so I think how you approach those interviews is different depending on how you, you know, on what the context is. There is one thing I have learned along the way, though, because I was one thing I was taught very early on was. Always tell the interview subject to incorporate the question <laughs> into their answer, which I now feel is like – and people ask me to do that often when I'm interviewed. I feel like that is the worst piece of advice you could ever give anybody because it's the – you immediately – um, make it a very artificial exchange instead of a conversation. And now, thankfully, you know, the rules of cinema have moved in such a way that you can almost cut from anything to anything. Um, and sometimes if you feel like somebody didn't give you enough detail about something, you can come in and, you know, go back around at the end and ask them the question again to tell the story or, or whatever. And that's what the two cameras are for. But the idea that you would make somebody think about every answer um, – in that artificial way before they answered seems like the worst possible advice you could ever give anybody. As our interview neared its end, I talked to Alex about his fiction projects in development. It reminded me of a conversation I had with Jonathan Demi for episode six of Pure Nonfiction. This piece of Demi's interview didn't make it into the final episode. I wonder what your advice would be to, to a career documentary maker who's, who's now going to be shooting something in fiction. Oh. Um, turn around, go back. <laughs> uh, Is that was it, that was his advice? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was somewhat glib advice, but uh, yeah. but I I think that I think there was a genuineness of, about it too. Yeah, it's advice well received. I, I think you have to you go into it. You know, I, along the way, I had been given an opportunity to direct this or that fiction project, 
and I never found the right project that was particularly interesting or could convey the right idea. The idea that anybody, a doc, particularly at this moment in time where documentary is so vital and so much fun, uh, there are all sorts of things about fiction that are really irritating. You have this huge machine. It's very difficult to move that machine. Actors. Actors. Well, I, I think actors are great, but but I think documentarians actually have a, an advantage with actors in the sense that you're not telling the actor, do this. Hmm. You know, you're more comfortable with the idea that the actor would explore and you would follow, you would capture. Um, and I th so I think there are, there are all sorts of interesting aspects of moving back and forth between the two that I think is exciting. And I, I think, because I think to be truthful, uh, documentarians have learned a lot from fiction filmmaking over the last 15 years, and that's what's made them so great. And likewise, fiction films have learned a lot from, from documentaries. So uh, it's, it's being able to have a sense of what it is you want to say and trying to make sure that you don't let the machine get in your way to say it if you have something new to say. And I think maybe that's the difference is that the machine in documentary is a smaller machine. It's a smaller machine, so it's much easier to manipulate it. And that is a useful thing. And sometimes it's manipulating you because you're just sitting there with your camera watching things happen before your eyes and wondering, oh, my God, how do I make sense of this? That's kind of exciting. I want to thank Alex Gibney for joining me. Zero Days is now playing in theaters and on video on demand. In our next and final episode of season one, I talk to Barbara Koppel, the two-time Oscar-winning director of Harlan County, USA and American Dream. Her new film is Miss Sharon Jones, about the soul singer as she battles cancer. 50 years of souls gone by, 50 more to come. You think you sing something? I said, Lord, I've just begun. Thanks to the Pure Nonfiction team, series producer Michael Scotty Jr., sound mixer Kyle Murphy, marketing coordinator Sarah Modo, and executive producer Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. If you like what you've heard, the best way to support us is to subscribe on iTunes. And please spread the word to your friends. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.